Our guest in the segment is Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Phil, we are great, and we appreciate you joining us this morning with news of a Steelers victory and playoff appearance, Phil. Good and gloat, baby. Uh, can, can, can you believe it? Because it's hard for me to gloat because I think about a month ago, I was throwing in my towel, my terrible towels. I was so depressed about losing those three straight games. And lo and behold, they win three straight and somehow get into the playoffs. So good for them. They're on a streak. They played some really good football over the last three weeks. Hopefully that can carry over to Buffalo. That If there's any team I didn't want them to play when they got into the playoffs, kind of rooting for Miami last night. Because I think if Miami would have won, they would have ended up playing Kansas City. I think that was how it would have worked out. And I was more excited about that than Buffalo. But the two hottest teams – In the AFC right now is Buffalo and Pittsburgh, and they have to face each other in the first round. A neat little backstory: Buffalo's head coach and Mike Tallman used to be roommates in college. That's kind of kind of cool. But uh, hopefully Pittsburgh can pull that one out, and then we get to go if they can pull that one out. It's going to be tough. They're a nine and a half point underdog. But if they can pull that out, then they get to go back to Baltimore, and, and who wouldn't want that? Now, Phil, the the uh, thing that came out of the weekend was the curse of the terrible towel continues to keep a, a strong bit of momentum. Uh, this was the terrible towel was invented by Myron Cope, a, pir- a Steelers broadcaster, who had a child who ha- was a special needs child and was institutionalized. And Myron took all the proceeds from the terrible towel and donated them to this facility and uh, set up a trust so that all proceeds going forward after his death would continue to go to benefit this facility and these types of facilities. And from that day forward, anyone, any team which has defaced the terrible towel has incurred <laughs> the wrath of the curse of the terrible towel. Now, the Jacksonville Jaguars, who beat the Steelers earlier in the year, ran around the field defacing the terrible towel after their win. Well, the Jaguars needed to beat Tennessee to get into the playoffs. They lost to Tennessee, and by losing, what team got into the playoffs? The Pittsburgh Steelers. As the curse of the towel continues to reign over those who will dare to deface it. And I think that's been Cincinnati Bengals' problem all along. T.J. Hushman's audience. Yes, he's another one. With the towel. And they have been a uh, perennial disappointment ever since. So, they, I mean, they got to the Super Bowl and, and lost, but uh, they they haven't been uh, what what you would think they have been with some of their players since T.J. Hushmanzada used to do. But I'm excited. I'm excited for them, and I'm back on the Mike Tomlin bandwagon. Man, you <laughs> almost had me off of it. I had one and a half feet <laughs> off of the bandwagon, and you have to give them credit. And I hopefully they play Mason Rudolph and – and we, we do not go into the offseason with a quarterback controversy. Phil, let's talk money because we keep giving it away since we started the calendar year of 2024. I like the better. I like the latter half of 23 when we were making money. Yeah, and it's just, you know, we, we had we had a, quite the run there, and, we, and, and the run ended last week. NASDAQ was down, I think, about 4%. S&P was down about 2%. But that's all part of a healthy market, and there really hasn't been – any news? The Fed minutes kind of spooked us a little bit. When you know you have the speech from Jerome Powell, and then you get to dig into everything. They say, I don't know why that's so separated out from the speech, but then you get to dig into everything that they had said, and that spooked us a little bit about you know some of the Fed members weren't exactly on board with cutting rates as early as March. So those the odds of a March rate March rates cut went down some. And, but there really wasn't any significant news that would send our markets falling, except, you know, if you really just look at what, look at the mind of an investor. And when you had the run that we had in the fourth quarter of 2023, what's well, natural to sell some of that off, especially at the end of the year, sell some of that off and, and go ahead and take the gains or, and you get a little bit of a phrase. Hey, look, we're up 20 percent or whatever it may be. Let's go ahead and step back and take a breather and see how this works out. But there hasn't been any news that would send our markets falling or coming up. You know, Friday I was a, I was a little bit surprised, and it just goes to show that we, we don't know what we don't know, but we got a jobs report that was a little bit better, not, not much, but a little bit better than what was expected, and our markets really didn't have a reaction. I thought that was going to be bad for our markets and send us even further down. 
but it really didn't. It didn't. We didn't have much of a reaction at, at all. This week, the CPI report comes out, and I think it's really important that, again, we walk a tightrope with the CPI report where we see inflation continue to fall, but now we're getting to the point where I don't know that we want to see it fall drastically because that would then insert those recession fears again. And that could have been part of Friday's jobs report as well, where it kind of eased their minds if we started to think recession, that that robust jobs report kind of took us off of that. So maybe that was part of the reason why we didn't fall on Friday. But it, it is part of a bull market or a natural healthy market after you've had that kind of run. Eventually it's going to end, and last week it did. It ended. NASDAQ and S&P futures have turned slightly positive. At the moment, Dow futures are down about a third of a percent. Uh, oil fill this morning is plummeting, uh, down 3.5% just about. Natural gas is down 4%. I heard a news story this morning that the U.S. is now the number one producer of oil in the world uh, right now. And that uh, I can't remember the last time we produced as much oil as we produce are producing, according to this report. But we are producing a record amount of oil now in this country, which kind of goes against the Joe Biden won't let us drill for oil uh, narrative uh, that is out there. We are. And of course, this is an election year, uh, but we are apparently producing a bunch. It throws it in your face. I think we've been up there all along, but we're still uh, bound by some of what OPEC's decisions are. And we, you know, we, we often think that we, we, because it's so, we see it so much as consumers and not investors, but we put a little bit more into the price of oil than what we should and its impact on our markets. We know that the price of oil, that's why the CPI report removes uh, the price of energy in one of its reports. It's, it, says, it simply says, hey, look, it's volatile, it's cyclical, it goes up, it goes down. Rarely does it have a long-lasting impact, and, and it did in 2022, when, when it, or was it 21? But it, it, got, it got pretty rough on, on the price of uh, transportation front because of the price of oil, and it had an impact on everything, such as bananas and grocery stores and everything. Every, everything that had to be delivered, it had, a, it had an impact, of course, on it. But most of the time, you know, short-term moves in the price of oil, whether it's good or bad, typically has, doesn't have much impact on the market, as we assume that that's going to happen anyway. And it normally is driven by supply and demand, of course, and that supply in large part, it is OPEC does have a big hand in the supply of that. So that, that's the one key component for the price of oil that we can't take into account. And apparently OPEC has been producing a lot of oil, too. So I'm um, not sure you'd have thought this Mideast crisis with uh, Hamas and Israel would have just jacked gasoline prices up. But that's not been the case. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, I feel uh, I'm I'm struck. I'm always intrigued by the fact that we uh, we have good news on a host of fronts, but yet it doesn't seem to be breaking through to to the population as a whole. Uh, inflation is is going down. Yet it looks like we will not. Obviously, it was high, but it's gone down some. The trend is in the right direction. Uh, and we're not in a recession, which everybody a year or so ago said we would be. Unemployment job report is favorable. Uh, the earning, uh, individual earnings is up. Uh, the market is certainly up. Uh, the gas prices have gone down some. There's a host of good news. Yet, when the polls are taken, uh, are 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 we as a country going in the right direction economic-wise? Invariably, people say no, no. Do you have any sense at all? Are we, are we still baked in so much of the COVID years that people cannot get beyond that? I think the, the, the big perception and, and why you get that answer no on the economic front is most likely because of inflation. Although inflation is down from where it, it peaked out at 9%, we you, we do still see that in the grocery stores and in the price of food and and overall how much more everything costs. We've just shown the capacity and the willingness to still do it. We're still at the point with most things where and we never we never really backed off of it. That was kind of part of the problem where we were at the point where we would complain about the prices, but we didn't do anything about it. We didn't adjust our spending habits we still purchase the same thing that we always purchase we just were willing to spend more for it and there's no better uh, no better gauge of that than travel and back to the oil front you know the price of oil 
was supported when it was so so high back in the early spring and the summer. It was supported by us. If we just said, hey, we're not going to do this, the demand would have gone down and, and the price of oil would have come down quicker than what it did. So by and large, I think most of that, uh, when you when you read the consumer, and I'm one of them, when you read the consumer and they say, hey, now I'm not in a good place economically, although wages have come up, by and large, through this whole entire period, they haven't kept up with inflation. So if you had a four, I think the last at the last job report wages were up four percent, and that for the first time in a long time has kind of met inflation, and so therefore you don't see it in your pocketbook. I got a four percent raise. The average person is making four percent more. However, I don't have more, and I don't have more because of how much more everything costs. So that, I think that's part of the issue when you when you poll people and say, hey, how does the economy feel to you? Well, by and large, middle-class worker who hasn't switched jobs, who may not have gotten a huge increase in pay, they see less in their bank account, and that's where they're, the economy, they give it a negative mark for the economy because of that, what they see on a micro level. Plus, I, <clears throat> I think to talk about the reduction in the inflation rate is a little like – talking and, and boasting about it. it's a little like boasting that the the fire is burning slower now it doesn't help what's already burned i think the reason that that the polls are what they are is that everything costs 17 percent more than it did this time last year you know across the board according to whoever it is that mentions such things but as far as prices are concerned it's interesting i heard on the news today and i just pulled it up here that a european supermarket chain i'm going to have a hard time pronouncing it car for carry for i'm not sure is removing pepsi products from its shelves because they're saying that you can't blame inflation for the high prices anymore and until the prices come down uh, we're not going to stock Pepsi products. And I'm going to guess that the result of that is going to be the Pepsi products go down for that department store chain or that grocery store chain. Do we see that as as something for the future across the board here? Are people going to say, all right, the, you can't blame inflation anymore, so let's bring the prices down? Is, it, is there a chance that we will actually see prices decrease? And Pepsi stock, by the way, down 24 cents today. I think we see some of that reaction, and, and I'm talking grocery stores or, or sporting goods stores or wherever you go, I think you see part of that reaction with self-checkout. You know, I, I was listening this weekend to a few people complain about the self-checkouts, and the, the whole reason, I think, in my opinion, that the self-checkouts are there is in order to help keep prices, number one, to help keep prices down, Number two, bringing in brand new employees is so much more expensive than what it used to be. So I think one way you could do that is say, hey, I'm not going to carry a product anymore simply because of how much it costs. But number two, how do we adjust or how do we still make sure that we can make a profit and keep our prices somewhat down on, on the storefront, not, not the manufacturer front? In the manufacturer front, you're getting shrinkflation, of course, and that doesn't really ever go away. They just shrink it down and, and charge you the same thing, and the, and the price of inflation is, is embedded in that. But the, I think that is the reason why it's twofold. The reason why you walk into a store and there's not as many workers and or you have to do it yourself and self-checkout and bag it yourself and so forth and so on. And the reason for that is, number one, it's more difficult to get people to come into the door and work for a wage that you can still profit from. And number two, it does help kind of control the prices a little bit. When I go into the supermarket near my house, there are no longer any people checking out uh, people. It's There are those who go around to help the malfunctioning self-checkout lanes, but otherwise everything's a self-checkout lane. That would lane. be the lane I'm in. <laughs> that would be my lane every time. Yeah, and then same with the Home Depot. I don't, I don't remember the last time I saw somebody who was actually working a checkout Thing at a, at a Home Depot, uh, Phil. I want to ask you as well in regards to this. So uh, my kids are no longer of college age, but I have some leftover five twenty nine money, and I understand that there's been some changes in in terms of what you can do with five twenty nine money that you haven't spent on college educations for twenty twenty four. Phil, are you familiar with those yeah. rules? Yeah, very very much so, and it's part of Secure Act two point and it really does open the door. You know, some of these rules open the doors for people to invest in 529s more readily before you always had the concern, if I invest in a 529, what if my child doesn't go to school and then it becomes taxable and I've done all this 
for for no reason other than to get the state tax deduction. But now because of Secure Act 2.0, assuming that the deposits are in the account have been there, I think the account, and don't hold me to this, but I think the account has to have been open for at least 10 years, and the deposits have had to have been there for five years. So, for example, if I opened a 529 today and then I didn't start making deposits for five years from now, that would still be okay. Once my child graduated from school, if there's leftover money, you can roll that into a Roth account up to the annual limits. They still have to meet the requirements for Roth deposits for a Roth IRA, but you can do that on a tax-free basis. So if you really look at that from the very beginning of the dollar, I put money into this account, most likely got a state tax deduction, so I saved some money on that. Then hopefully that money grew, and then once that money grew, my child didn't use it. So if, it, if you use it, it comes out tax-free, right? So if I put 1000 in and it grows to 1500 and then I pull that 1500 out, that $500 worth of growth, which would normally have been a taxable, uh, a taxable event, but that $500 worth of growth is now tax-free because I've used it for education. However, if you get to the end of the education or you didn't use it at all and you think, well, now I've got this $500 worth of growth and a potential penalty, if there's no beneficiary for it, if, if there's no one else I can give it to, you can roll that $1,500 into a Roth IRA for the beneficiary if it meets those requirements of the 10 years, been there for 10 years and the deposits have been there for at least five years. And then you've got tax-free growth from that point on. So you got a state tax deduction when you put it in and that person still got tax-free growth. So that is a huge benefit for those people, the participants of 529 plans across the country. Bill, final questions for Phil. Yeah, it's not a question so much as observation, Phil. Uh, you have been labeled as a man who licks horses, licks horses' face. <laughs> and I, L- licks them in the mouth, Bill. He licks them in the I mouth, yeah. That went. Yeah, and, and I was. I and, that went away. No, no, no. And last Friday, I was labeled as the Admiral's rear. Now, my question is. What does Mr. Mario have in store for Mr. Gelstrap? I, I thought we already got it on this book <laughs> stuff. No, you got to have a label that's a, a yeah. Label? yeah. He'll come. Yeah. Rob's thinking about it. He'll he'll come up with. Uh, it. Yeah, I'm just put a lot of thought in it, and, and it must be disgusting. I, <laughs> now I thought I was under the impression when 2024 or 2023 came to an end, the whole licking the horse thing would go away. <laughs> But now apparently it's it's still around. So yeah, if you come up with something for John, it's going to have to be disgusting. It's disgusting anyway. It's something to look forward to. Phil, when you malaprop, it lasts forever, buddy. That's a tough one to get rid of because that one you can't write. That's that's got to be something that just I'm kind of falls organically. That. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm never going to outlive that. Uh, Phil, earnings reports uh, figure to dominate some of the upcoming weeks here. It, it will. The, the earnings coming out. On a on a individual level, I think will be really important. But uh, on hol- on a holistic point, you kind of see that this morning with Boeing. Boeing's having a really bad day, but our markets are still green on the as last I look anyway on the S and P and Nasdaq. You'll I think you'll see that with this quarter's earnings reports. But on holistically for all of all of the indices, uh, the the same old stuff that we've been talking about through throughout 22 and 23, which is CPI, PPI, and the alphabet uh, soup of reports that come out. That is going to be our focus, just like it has been before. We may want it to say a li- something a little bit different. We want to make sure that we're not on our way to a recession and we still see inflation continue to fall and support the Federal Reserve cutting rates. But most importantly, will be those reports and on the jobs front as well. But it is important for those individual companies, these earning reports come out. Can the, the world slow down and them still make a profit to the point where we want to invest in them? And that's what we'll be looking at. And Gilstrap did get grief for saying sports ball on the air a <laughs> month did, ago or so. It's a, but it's not disgusting, though. And it, it, you uh, haven't it, seen it, me it, play. It <laughs> <laughs> All right, Phil, Phil, I need a, a prediction. We've got the national championship game tonight, Michigan and Washington. This might have been... Uh, a Rose Bowl matchup a few years ago before we instituted the uh, the playoff system. Uh, what do you have for us here? Who do you think? And that's a tough one. That's a tough one. And and I was one that sc- I was screaming to the rooftops that Washington was going to beat Texas, and, and I was happy to see that they did. However, I'm going to go with Michigan tonight. 
38 to 34 to be a really good ball game. They're, they're, they are the two best teams in the country, and, the, and they should be playing for the national title. But two really good teams. But I'm going to go with John Harbaugh in Michigan, 38 to 34. It's a classic game of a of a offense that's very skilled and one of the best defenses in the in the country. Who are you, who are you taking there, Bill? Well, I, I like Washington. I'm not sure. I, I want them to win. I'm not sure they will win. But I'd like to see Washington win. Right, I think Michigan wins this game. The only thing I can predict for sure is that I won't be awake to see it because it's they kick off way too late and the game doesn't end until much much too late. All right, now, Phil, give me your Buffalo Bills, Pittsburgh Steelers prediction. You know what this is going to be? It's going to be the Pittsburgh Steelers 19-16. to Pittsburgh's going to find a way. They're going to have some people step up in place of T.J. Watt, Nick Herbig, and uh, number 44, and I keep forgetting his name. They're going to have uh, breakout games, and we're going to win that football game 19-16. to That's Marcus Golden, isn't it, 44? Yes, it is Marcus Golden. Yes, yeah. it is. Phil, uh, how do the folks reach you for more information about money? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here, Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Talk to you later, buddy.